So this, as you know, is our second uh, conference for the critical edition of Whitehead. The last one was held in December of 2017, which was for the first volume of the critical edition on the lectures, lecture notes uh, from 1924-1925 period. And the uh, lead editor of that volume, as I mentioned earlier, Paul Bogart is here with us today. And, uh, and so today we're celebrating and investigating together, trying to figure out what the significance is of the second volume of the critical edition, which was published in, what is it, Joe, February of 21? Is that? Uh, January, I think, but yeah. yeah. Close. So here we are um, looking at, at, this, at this new volume. Uh, the, the edition itself started, and I'll just probably give you a quick historical introduction. I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Joe to introduce himself and to talk a little bit about next, next steps as we get started here. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, the edition started really around 2005 a lot of uh, trying to find materials all over the world. So we had some that we'd already gathered over decades from different colleagues like um, Victor Lowe at Johns Hopkins and, and uh, Lewis Ford and others had gathered materials. And then there was just a lot squirreled away. And one of the things we find with this work is that there are archives all around the world that have uh, materials, but we don't really know it until they digitize those materials. And then all of a sudden we can search through the materials and find new items. And so Joe and I uh, on Whitehead's birthday every year do a search of the internet. And most every year we find something new. So we've been gathering materials. We spent about a decade uh, doing that gathering of materials and digitizing them. And that took a good long while. And after that initial period, then we started uh, doing the work of transcribing the materials, since um, a lot of the materials are in this first uh, parts, the lecture notes are all handwritten. So the transcription itself is an enormous undertaking. Uh, and then you go through the process of verifying them. So each uh, volume, we have editors, those editors each independently go line by line verifying the transcriptions uh, to the originals, which is also a very long, labor-intensive, time-consuming process to verify the, the accuracy of the transcripts. The transcriptions themselves were usually done by graduate students at either Claremont or at graduate or at, here at Gonzaga University, uh, which has been a, a huge boon as well. Uh, so that process takes a while, and, and uh, that's regrettable that there's such a, an interval between uh, the publishing of one volume and the next. We, as Joe will explain, we hope to pick up the speed a little bit now that Joe is uh, working full time on this uh, this effort. Uh, but that's that's sort of how we got got started. So we've been editing pro volumes since around I want to say 2015 ish. Um, so the last seven years or so. Um, and hoping to, to pick up speed. But I'll, I'll hand it over to my colleague, Joe, to talk a little bit about um, you know, his work himself and where we're headed next. So over to you, Joe. Uh, hey, everybody. I'm coming at you from uh, Wisconsin uh, in the United States. And um, weird to say that uh, I've actually been at the project for almost 10 years now. I started in February 2013 as an editorial assistant and I'm the uh, Whitehead Research Project's chief archivist and the associate editor of the edition. Um, it's uh, It's been a hoot. Um, of course, I co-edited the volume that we're all talking about today. Uh, but I thought I would just uh, go over, oh, I should start, do have a little PowerPoint here. Um, let's share that. Um, so I wanted to briefly take everyone through kind of our overall plans for the critical editions future uh, real quickly, um, which is going to be a, a decades long project. Uh, these plans can and have evolved as time goes on, uh, but this is what things look like right now. Uh, we currently plan on having 17 volumes in the critical edition. Uh, six will cover Whitehead's lectures at Harvard from 1924 to 1937. Two will collect his essays and articles that don't appear in his monographs. Two volumes will cover Whitehead's correspondence, both to and from. Uh, six volumes will collect his previously published monographs. And finally, there will be one volume of collected papers that don't fit neatly into any of these other categories. Uh, so let's look at all of these a little more closely. Uh, as everyone here well knows, uh, we've already published the first two volumes of the Harvard Lectures in 2017 and 2021. 
Uh, these lectures have been the early focus of the project due to their great potential to really change what we think we know about Whitehead's philosophy and its development. Uh, since he left No Knock Loss, the notes of his students and colleagues are kind of our best chance to see his thinking in action. And while I may be partial, I think these first two volumes have already given us a lot of important material to chew on and will only become more important as time goes on and scholars dig into their content further. Uh, as you can see, we've already completed initial transcription for volumes three, four, and five, with the initial transcription underway for volume six. It's taken us on average about a year of grad students working part-time to transcribe each volume. Um, they range from about 800 to 1500 pages of handwritten notes each. Uh, I'll mention a few things about some of the upcoming volumes that might be fun to know. Um, volume three, of course, covers the period leading up to the delivery of Whitehead's Gifford lectures in the summer of 1928. Uh, one thing I can tell you, having transcribed most of the notes for these volumes myself, is that Whitehead presents what look to be early drafts of some of those lectures to the students in his Harvard classes in a way he hadn't done with his previous books. So for this reason, uh, we potentially stand to learn a lot about the composition of process and reality that we couldn't have known before, so that's exciting. Uh, an interesting thing to note about volume four is that although it covers the longest period of time in any of the volumes, it won't necessarily be any longer than the others because there are some gaps. Um, we've chosen the divisions we have based on the materials we're able to find. And as must almost inevitably be the case in a project like this, uh, the coverage of materials is uneven. Uh, sometimes we have five people taking notes on the same Whitehead class, other times we have none. Uh, in the case of volume four, we don't have any notes for the fall semester of, of uh, 1931 at all. But of course, we'll publish the most complete record of Whitehead's lectures that we possibly can. Uh, and a distinguishing feature of volume five is that it will contain far more material on Whitehead's seminar, seminaries or seminars um, than any of the other volumes. This is because for the spring of 1934, 1935, Whitehead co-taught his seminary in metaphysics with William Ernest Hawking, and Hawking was much better about keeping notes than Whitehead was. And since these seminaries were discussion-based, we'll hopefully get a chance to see Whitehead thinking even more on his feet than in his lectures, which were a little more prepared. Uh, moving on to the volumes of essays and articles, um, Brian and I are currently working on both of those, and the first volume is nearing completion. Uh, currently, the first volume contains 30 essays, and the second volume contains 48 on account of the later essays being somewhat shorter on average. I should mention that in addition to essays that never appeared in books, these volumes will contain all the essays from the Organization of Thought, Aims of Education, and Essays in Science and Philosophy. And the reason for that is that these three books were always looser collections in comparison to Whitehead's other monographs. Uh, so we made the decision to break them up. Uh, it can be easy to forget, in fact, that Organization of Thought and Aims of Education are substantially the same book. They have six chapters in common. Um, but in any case, some of these essays and articles have never been seen before at all, while others were never reprinted after their initial publication. Also, many contain a great number of errors. Um, for example, in reviewing Whitehead's memoirs on the algebra of symbolic logic, uh, Dr. Robert Valenza, who's co-editing the first volume of essays and articles with Dr. Henning and myself, identified no less than 41 substantive errors in the equations and expressions. So there's a lot to be done. Um, by critically editing and collecting all these essays and articles in one place and in chronological order, it should become much easier for scholars to follow the line of Whitehead's philosophical development and see elements of his thought that were previously difficult to access. Um, and we are aiming to have both of these volumes published in the next few years. So moving to correspondence briefly, um, Whitehead was notoriously bad at responding to letters, but nonetheless, we gathered about 1300 letters, both to and from Whitehead across North America and Europe. Um, the current plan is for one volume to focus solely on Whitehead's correspondence with Bertrand Russell, much of which is, uh, of course, concerns the Principia. 
uh, while the other volume will collect his remaining correspondence. And work on both of these volumes is ongoing, though at the moment they're not our primary focus. Uh, next, for the monographs, um, we're currently planning on six chronologically ordered volumes, which we've grouped together based largely on total length. Uh, deciding on these groupings now gives us the freedom to work on them in any order as copyrights expire. Uh, since the first two volumes will be much more difficult to edit due to the large amount of now somewhat arcane uh, mathematical symbolism and also less in demand than his later philosophical works, we'll, we will possibly wait a while to tackle those and move on to the other volumes. And um, finally, there will be a volume of collected papers, which will include all materials that don't neatly fit in the, into the other volumes. Uh, some examples include short obituaries that Whitehead wrote for friends and colleagues, as well as some referee reports he wrote on papers submitted to the Aristotelian Society and all sorts of other things. Um, but due to its nature as a bit of a grab bag of miscellaneous materials, this volume will likely appear very near the end of the critical editions timeline. Uh, but that's uh, about it, I think, for a broad overview of where the, the uh, edition is going. Thank you, Joe. We do have a um, need to be able to keep funding this work. What's making it possible for us to make more progress more recently is um, some generous support from uh, from colleagues and friends who want to see this work happen. To, it's made it possible to hire Joe full time. And, and when he finished his PhD and um, recently and, and was then hired by the edition working full time, uh, that makes all the difference. Joe's exceptionally good at this work, um, and it, it's it's really painstaking. So if you or uh, someone you know is in a position to be able to support the edition, it really does help. We're able to achieve quite a bit with um, with relatively little in terms of resources. So please always consider that if that's something you can do. Uh, Joe, you can go ahead and pull that down. And then uh, we do have a few minutes uh, before transitioning to the next. I wanted to give folks a chance. That if you have a question about uh, what Joe just went through in terms of the future of the edition, uh, we do have a little bit of time. So maybe go to the reactions button again at the bottom if you wanted to ask a question and click on raise hand and we'll create a stack. And um, then we can take them orderly if anybody has any questions about the, the future volumes and our plans for editing and, and publishing them. So just well, go to reactions. Yeah, go ahead, Joe. One of the things we're working on right now is uh, clearing some of the copyrights for, uh, for volume two, which has been uh, an interesting and, and fun time. Because uh, there's that 95 years um, generally is the, uh, the copyright period before it enters public domain. And so we're hoping to get all of those permissions secured um, so that we can publish the volume uh, you know, earlier than would otherwise be possible because the last thing he wrote was in 1942 or 43, which would mean you know, waiting 10 or 15 years. We don't want to do that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's always interesting doing that kind of stuff because you find some of these publishers will just say, oh yeah, sure, go ahead. And other ones want over a thousand dollars to to reprint an article from 80 years ago. Um, and it, in at least one case, I emailed a publisher and they were like, this isn't ours, we didn't publish this. And I emailed them back and said, yes, you really did. I promise you, you did. Um, and yet they can't find any record of it. Uh, George, George, feel free. Sorry, Joe, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I'm just please. getting the queue here. Uh, but I did want to ask you about those early volumes uh, that uh, Professor Valenza is, hope, is helping you with. Those errors he's finding, are they in the, in the mathematics and the symbolism uh, not notation? Are they grave and serious and represent anything that would lead us to question Whitehead's mastery of the material, or are they the sort of things that any person in that field could, you know, while writing a book or an article, could make um, just inadvertently uh, and a 
no consequence other than that they are mistakes. You know, since um, I don't understand all of the math material myself, um, in some ways I'm not, you know, best qualified to answer that. But at the same time, I think I can say with some confidence that many, many of these errors, if not the, I think probably the majority are like typesetting errors and things where Whitehead just did not review the manuscript well enough. In fact, that uh, there is that article is one of his only late math ones, that indication classes numbers validation, that was 1934, where there were a number of errors that he found later and has the, this core agenda of here's all these errors that he sent into mind, here are corrections. But for a lot of these early math articles, I mean, you have to remember, as we discovered when we found that math article for the Aristotelian Society in 1899 that never got published, he was submitting these things handwritten because it's not like we had computers. Um, and so I think a lot of the errors were just the typesetters taking this handwritten stuff and putting in the wrong thing and Whitehead not checking them. He does not seem to have been good about checking his work um his proofs so i think that's mostly where where that stuff comes from thanks that's that's good to know one of the arguments we're trying to make to the national endowment for humanities in our latest application is to show that um even these materials that were previously published uh, in in you know in an article form that um that you would expect you know, it's freely available. People can get it. We're trying to make the claim and show that actually we're, we are critically editing in the, in the we are catching and fixing errors in the original that affects the meaning. So even though they're typesetting errors, it's still the original had errors that affected the meaning. I don't think they were Whitehead's fault necessarily. I don't, to answer, I think Joe's right from my perspective, George. Um, so, but that still nevertheless really affects the the you know, usefulness of the text and the accuracy is affected. So that's some value add. All right. Any other questions about what we're up to, where we're headed? The, the volume of essays and articles, volume one that Joe was just mentioning uh, that we're working on right now. So we're taking a pause on the Harvard lectures right now. So we, we just published two, volume two, HL2, and we're uh, talking about that today and tomorrow. Uh, we're pausing on the lectures for a little while and focusing on the essays and articles. Um, hope to get both of those out in relatively quick succession. That's our goal, is to be able to, to do that. Because they were largely already published materials, it's going faster rather than having handwritten materials that, that has to be painstakingly uh, verified. The verification process goes faster. There's some math challenges, but we're, we're working through those. Um, so that first volume of essays and articles is out for peer review right now. So we hope to have a, a contract soon. And, and um, even though it'll take forever to still appear, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's moving along nicely. Uh, Prasad. Hi, um, really enjoy uh, just the thought of all this stuff coming to the surface um, at last. Uh, my question is uh, regarding science in the modern world and its 100th anniversary of its publication. Uh, does anything coincide with that? Will we have a critical edition by then or near there? Or what are the plans for that year, I guess, is my general question. Yeah, Joe uh, was kind of hinting at that. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah, for our, our, our NEH application, um, it's the 8 millionth one. Hopefully, it'll be the charm. Uh, we are seeking to do the volume that's um, uh, let me just look at our divisions again, but it would be the fourth volume of monographs um, chronologically, which would include science in the modern world, religion in the making, and symbolism. And um, if we did get that grant, we've included that as part of the work we want to do is to transcribe and critically edit those three volumes. I don't know that it'll necessarily be out by the 100th anniversary, but it should be fairly soon afterwards, I would hope. To answer the question from Landon in the chat, uh, the division is the Scholarly Editions and Translations grant. Um, and so we are, hope springs eternal this time, as Joe said, uh, will be the trick, who, who knows? 
Um, <clears throat> so we're just about ready to start our first paper. Um, George, I, uh, I was hoping to turn over to you in case you're interested, just as general editor and making some brief comments if you, if you wanted to. I didn't give you a warning, so if you don't have anything you'd like to share, but I wanted to create a space for you if you'd like to. Thank you very much, uh, Brian and, and Joe. Um, and give my greetings, everybody. Uh, you may not know it, but I am titularly speaking the general editor of uh, of the edition, which is means nothing more than that Brian and Joe have been kind enough to include me in some of the deliberations. And uh, uh, also, I've been pleased to work for both of them scampering around uh, geographical spots uh, that they weren't able to get to themselves to find materials or meet with people and, and so forth. Um, and I remain, you know, a huge supporter and fan of this project, as well as in awe of what the two uh, editors have done, uh, along with Paul Bogart, our first uh, volume editor. Um, just uh, being able to be around, watch them work occasionally, discuss some things with them has been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. And uh, I wish I could do more and was doing more, but I'm going to try to keep doing what I'm doing for as long as I can. Uh, so thanks for including me. <laughs> Thank you very much, George. All right. So I think here we are ready to start um, in just a minute. We've got our first presentation. Let me see if I can. Yeah. So Sylvia, I see you're in the room. Joe, would you like uh, to introduce our first speaker? And uh, so so actually, stop. Actually not. I forgot to mention how we'll handle um, presentations and then you can introduce her. So and I'll have to repeat this a few times. Apologies, because some speakers I think will be coming and going. And so just uh, our basic routine is pretty straightforward. Each session has 30 minutes, uh, rough 20 minutes of which will be for presentation and 10 minutes for discussion. So as you're um, listening, do keep a note of whether or not you'd like to jump in during the Q&A, uh, either in the chat or by raising your hand. Uh, to keep track of time, which is sometimes challenging via Zoom, um, we're going to let the speaker uh, know when, uh, when they are having about three minutes left. And so Joe will just give a, a verbal sort of warning, which yeah, can um, three minutes. Try not to be startled. Exactly. And then I'll uh, have the hook and let you know when you're out of time. And I um, I am pretty diligent with trying to keep us on time so that all the speakers have a full amount of time to make a presentation and have discussion. So I will hold you to that 20 minutes, uh, which can be frustrating. But I just be forewarned. <laughs> I will. And so then we'll switch over to Q&A, which I don't know about you, but is always my favorite part, uh, so we can discuss these ideas in, in community.